Of course, I feel the need to cough as soon as I turn the microphone on. <laughs> Hello, fellow Sublime Text fanatics. Odat Nerd here. Welcome to tonight's live stream for October the 27th. And um, yes, I do have it just together enough that I need to do a <clears throat> check on my uh, watch to see what the actual day of the month is. I just finished earlier today. Um, <clears throat> running for just a second. Um <clears throat> uh, scheduling out the remainder of the live streams for uh, next month because it just should be the last live stream for October. So I scheduled up all of the ones for November. Uh, they're all in currently on a Tuesday at 8 o'clock, the usual uh, time frame, i.e. now-ish. Um, and uh, as pointed out by uh, Ben in the in the Discord, uh, apparently YouTube really likes to let everybody know about schedule of things, even if you schedule in advance. So I've made all of the ones that aren't tonight unlisted, and then uh, at the end of each stream, I'll unlist the next one. And uh, hopefully that will, will resolve that problem. Now that's going to take us into December, and uh, this is the point where we decide what it is that we want to do this coming December. As you know, I always do November. Uh, the thing where you spend at least one hour a day, every day, coding, and then write a log, uh, a dev log about it. Uh, in the spirit of uh, embracing the idea that everybody should know how to program and uh, just sort of making that whole thing pop uh, public, I should say. Now, a couple of years ago, I attempted to do a single live stream every day for at least an hour for the entirety of... Uh, December and I was doing real well until near the end of the the month uh, for the last two weeks I guess I did about did that for about two two and a half weeks I can't remember exactly and then I got the worst cold that I have had in a quite some time and was unable to do that because I was uh, unable to talk and even if you uh, follow my videos on the other channel linked down in the description below uh, you'll notice that all the videos that happened round about that time were uh, quite uh, quite scratchy for a little while there before I fully recovered. I'm thinking I might do something like that again this year. Um, the only issue with that is finding time to do this for an hour every night and still get videos done for the other channel. So we'll see how that all works out. So if you have ideas for projects that we could do, um, I've always kicked around the idea of a plug-in a day every day for an entire month, uh, something that we could do uh, just to get that sort of thing out there, or uh, one larger project, the aborted year, the thing I was doing was the uh, remote build system. Something to keep in mind. Uh, for tonight, however, we're going to go a little more um, low-key with this sort of thing. Uh, I'm... I do have some stuff that I want to do in Override Out, but I don't really want to work on that tonight. I just sort of want to relax after a busy day and play around with some stuff. So we're going to do a couple of things or try to do a couple of things that I was thinking of doing last week, uh, but we never got to, which is I, I use a package called File Manager, which provides various file management options in Sublime for creating files, moving files, things of that nature. And I found uh, since... Hang on a second. Hello, sir. My faithful canine companion has decided that he is uh, going to join us tonight. Hello, Victor. Um, how you go? How, how's it? How's it going this evening? Uh, I use the file manager plugin, and as I said, it, it's for you know managing files, um, which is one of those things that is quote unquote lacking in Sublime. I guess there's a sidebar that lets you see files, but there's not a lot you can do with it. Um, and I use that and it, I wanted to sort of get in the habit of should, can I do more file manipulations uh, inside of Sublime instead of dropping into a console. And I found myself over a period of time, I really only use a couple of functionalities in that. One of them is deleting a file and one of them is creating a new file uh, at a very specific location. So it seemed to me a fun thing to play with to try to create uh, plugins to uh, to replicate those couple of functionalities. And actually for the delete one, I'm pretty sure there's already a built-in command that I could do the bulk of the work. So I just sort of need to replicate the functionality. Uh, but I haven't really given any thought to how all of this might work, just sort of as a high-level overview. So 
be a fun time to just try to play with some stuff and see what we come up with. And Victor is saying uh, it's morning here in India. I was just saying uh, earlier that uh, I'd really love to live stream at other times in the day. For me right now in the west coast of Canada, it is uh, 8 p.m. or just about uh, 10 after 8 right now. This is really the only time evenings that I have to do something like this. So my main live audience is people from uh, India, Australia, uh, Europe, and uh, other areas where the time puts it at perhaps a, a better part of the day for viewing uh, as opposed to a lot of people at this time of night are probably, you know, chilling with some TV and getting ready for bed or something. And Victor says, just now finished an assessment test while test waiting for breakfast. Ooh, breakfast. I like breakfast. I like breakfast a lot, especially fruit bowls. In any case, I think that's enough banter. I'm reasonably assured that the little graph over there telling me that the stream health as good isn't going to fluctuate wildly. Hopefully audio is still cool. So I'm going to press the magic button. Maybe. There it is. Hello, fellas of Blind Text Fanatics. Odan Nerd here. Did I mention last week I got my monitoring set up and now I deafen myself with that thing because it's a lot louder in my ears than it is uh, when it plays there than when I'm doing the pre-tech. I really need to tweak that. I am working on a new intro. I'm trying to replace the software that I use to create that with something completely different, which requires me to replicate it, maybe tweak it up a little bit, maybe change some of the graphics. But with all the stuff going on, uh, what can you do? In any case, we are going to be working on some, uh, as unsurprisingly, some plugin development tonight in Sublime. And I'm going to try to replicate, uh, if you will, a couple of functionalities from the file manager package that I use because it has a lot of stuff in it, but I really don't use all of it. Uh, so it seems like a fun exercise in replicating that just to not have to use another package if I could replace it with a small plugin and also just to see how something like that is put together, how it all works, how it could work. Uh, which I think is just sort of a great learning exercise in general. I've spent all of the time that I've spent writing software, which is all the way back in grade five, I've always you know, liked to do things, try things, experiment with things, reinvent the wheel such as it is, uh, because I've always been a guy that learns by doing. Um, so I thought we might uh, pull a little bit of that here tonight. Uh, well, that just required me to sit up more in my chair, so that's unfortunate, but We'll see what we can do. Ah. There we go. So <clears throat> the thing that we're going to try to replicate is two functionalities of the file manager package, one of which is creating a new file and the other of which is deleting a file. Now, to be sure, there is a delete mechanism in Sublime that can be triggered from the sidebar, but I don't tend to... I use the sidebar to visualize the layout of files, particularly in more complicated things, and maybe to find files and uh, load them sometimes if I'm unfamiliar with the names of things. When I'm working with my own code that I'm more familiar with, I tend to rely more on the symbol uh, navigation and the uh, go to anything to be able to find the files that I'm looking for. But for example, in work, we're working in a very large uh, mono repo with lots of projects in it. I find myself having to use the sidebar to find the actual file that I want because I'm not entirely sure what it's named or how the project is laid out. But uh, apart from that, I don't really use the sidebar at all. So I've sort of gotten into the habit of using the command palette to find commands that I use most frequently. And uh, File Manager fit the bill for that. But I really only use a couple of parts of it. I I still find, and again, I was I was sort of thinking, should I be trying to use this more to move files around? Uh, but the ability with Terminus to just hit this key and instantly have uh, a terminal open like this to be able to quickly move a file around hasn't really... Um, twig for me for I'd really rather do I'm more used to doing that I actually kind of dread file management in Windows because it's more based on using the file manager and I don't really use that uh, super often um, so the two things that we're going to work on is deleting a file and creating a file now there is a command as I said that's in the sidebar for deleting a file and as a matter of fact it's something that used to be 
in the default package in Sublime, and now it's in the core instead. Um, so I think we can leverage that command to actually do what it is that we want to do here. And we just sort of need to replicate uh, our own plugin because it's meant to be executed from the sidebar. So I'm going to uh, view the sidebar menu like so. And said command would be delete file where args is files and prompt is false. Now I haven't actually played with any of this. I've always said in the introduction, I've thought of sort of how I think this and the other thing we're going to be doing, excuse me, probably should work. Um, but apart from that, I haven't really uh, gone into any great detail. So it's really sort of an exploration of, of things here. So just to say, um, if I was to create a new file, it's going to create, and this is the other thing that we're going to be trying to create here. We could create a file like home tmartin sample.delete me, for example. And I have some file and I throw some lorem text in it and save it. And then I decide, eh, I'm done with this now. More often than not, what I actually do is create a new plugin file to help someone on the forum or Stack Overflow write a little thing to show them. And then after I've pasted, I need to clean it up. And I do file manager delete. And it asks me confirm, send to trash, uh, select an individual item to remove it from the deletions list, which is not something that I'm going to uh, be doing. And uh, I'm for not entirely sure what that actually does, to be perfectly honest. I think that's the name of the file. Yeah. Um, so just to see if I do this, that should shoot this file off to the trash. And I think if I click this and actually click it, this is how frequently I actually use the file manager. I might end up with two now. I think it's, yeah. It was it was thinking about one of the things that I have fired up that, uh, all right, so there's the, there's the file that I just deleted. Um, so I'm going to do that again. Maybe we'll just leave that open for the time being. Create a new file at Martin, delete me two, for example. The nice thing about this is it creates a file and opens it for you, and you can specify directories that don't necessarily exist, and it'll create them. So it's very easy to move things around. I use it in a very specific way that we'll see in just a minute. We'll throw some lorem text in here. Now, the name of that command was delete file. So I could, pro I assume this is going to be a window command because it's not associated with, or it could be a application command, but window command can execute application commands too. So it's delete file. Um, so we might say window run command and the command is delete file and then the arguments for this is going to be a key named files. Now in the sidebar, um, I'll just jump over there for a second. Commands can have ders, paths, and files specified as one of their arguments and if you're in the sidebar menu uh, then the command will be executed. Uh, this list will be filled out with all of the directories that are selected, all of the files that are selected, or if you use paths, files, and um, directories. So you can decide if you want to only work on directories, only work on files, or both. And it automatically fills that in with the full absolute names of the files. So for that, I probably need to pick copy file path here so I can paste it into this thing. Now, I'm, I'm just testing this. This appears to uh, take an argument of prompt that's set to false. I assume that means it's not going to prompt you before it deletes the file. Uh, clearly, I tend to use the other thing, so I've never actually used this command. Uh, but we might throw something like that in there and swap that around. Um, we'll make sure It's actually going to delete that file, so that should be cool. So let's see what happens. Anything? Well, that... Uh, that looks like a file what is deleted now. And if we look here, it's totally in the trash. So that command sends things to the trash, which is what I would expect because, uh, as I said, this used to be implemented in the default package um, using the send to trash uh, library. And now it's in the core. So that's not a plugin anymore. Um, I'm going to empty this trash so we don't need this anymore. And I'm going to 
save that to resurrect it back to where it was just to see what happens. I'm going to set this to true. Um, and it's totally asking delete file that and I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And it has deleted it and sent it to the trash. So realistically, the thing that what I'm used to doing is delete file and then saying I want to confirm for send item to trash or cancel is the two things that I do. I never really choose that particular thing and I only ever do it for one file. I don't use it for a bunch of files. So while technically I don't need to do anything at all and I could just use the run command with prompt true to true to be prompted. Um, I find it easier to navigate the quick panel or in this case, it's probably uh, the command palette. I would guess it might not be uh, to be able to see the options here. So I'm going to write just a simple wrapper command that will allow me to confirm or cancel on a deletion and then defer to that actual thing. And then I can have the exact same experience, but I don't necessarily need to have the file manager package installed to do it. And now I always like to say in my videos, the nice thing, the thing that I really love about Sublime, and this is something that we were talking about earlier in the Discord today to some degree, is that uh, you really get to tune it to the way that you like to work. And I often find when I'm using other software that, um, you end up not getting the software to work like you want to work, but trying to modify your own workflow habits to work the way that the designer of the software you're using thought you should work. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I find that sort of grading. It, it, it sort of breaks the workflow of what it is that you like to do if you're forced to take weird circuitous steps because the person that wrote something decided that something should be working different than yours. Not that that's bad or anything, it's just different. Uh, and that's why I love Sublime because instead of trying to be absolutely everything to everybody, it's a nice subset of functionality that it has, and then you can augment it to give it the functionality you want. You don't have any of the stuff you don't. You really make your life a whole lot better. Um, and we're going to have to save this bad boy now. Well, uh, what should we call this? Uh, we'll call it file operations. What the heck? And we're going to need uh, boop, boop, boo. We'll call our command prompt delete file command and we're going to say window command, text command. It could be a text command and then it could always, because it's going to infer the name of the current file on this particular case. So that's probably makes the most sense. So I probably didn't even really need to implement that. I can go ahead and just blump that down like so. Um, like so. And we're going to say... We need an argument for this, some argument, whose default value is going to be, let's say, nothing. And we want it to be true or false. True to say, yes, actually delete this file, and false to say, no, don't delete this file. And if it's called without an argument, that's our cue to actually prompt in the command palette to ask you to confirm whether you want to delete or not delete. Now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure it's probably the uh, it's probably a, a quick panel that that file manager command is using for this, and not um, not a input handle like we're going to use. So it is going to be a text command, but we're going to say self.window.run command. And the command is this, delete file. And we're going to need to pass it some arguments, which is this. We'll just go ahead and copy that out. We're going to want the, I don't know if that has an argument. I'm going to assume that, or a default value, I should say. I'm going to assume that it doesn't. Uh, oh, actually, we should probably say if some arg do this, right? Don't just automatically always delete stuff. And the files we're going to want to delete is that. 
Let's see if we can keep it in our heads to use all single quotes for this operation tonight. And we'll do that. We don't need this and this. Instead of being a hard-coded file, it should be name so that it works on the file that's currently existing. Everything seems to be OK. And then we can do an is enabled for the same thing and say self.view.filename is not none. Uh, and let's do one more thing here. Uh, that. Uh, and this is the bit where I'm going to need to swap myself to uh, exists. Is it os.path.exists or os.path.isfile? Um, maybe both of those things. os.path.isfile returns true if the path is an existing regular file. So is not none and os.path.isfile. Oh, it's one word. Eh. Self.view.filename. So we only want our command to be enabled in files that actually have a name, so it won't show up in scratch buffers or new tabs because they're not backed by a file yet, so there's no need to try to delete one. And we only want to do it if the file actually exists. So after you've deleted a file, it doesn't ask you if you want to delete the file again, because as we just saw, just because you delete a file doesn't mean that uh, the tab goes away and it still remembers the name of the file that it had with it. And I might have to do this. Uh, Victor's asking, is that a PyDoc? Is that PyDoc a package? That, that thing that I just did here? Uh, no, that's a very simple plugin that I created that just opens. Uh, it does a search directly in the, the thing and opens it in my browser, which just always happens to be on the other monitor. I experimented briefly in live streams with trying to swap to this, but I kept forgetting to move the uh, the input back the other way. So I kind of got out of the way of doing that. But I suppose uh, basically it's this. <laughs> it asks you for a search term, and then it searches the plugin help. Now, actually, I should probably change this because now I'm using Sublime 4. It's using Python 3.8. I could be searching for uh, better documentation than I am. Part of the reason why I wrote this is because way back when I originally did it, um, the official doc version of Python had gone well past 3.3. It was probably like 3.5 or something at the time. Uh, and the URL for the default always went to the wrong thing and I, uh, to the, the new documentation and the, the documentation for Python 3.3 wasn't in the list, so I constantly had to go up there and uh, manually fiddle with the URL, and it was a big pain in the butt. Just uh, for, for giggles here, there's two ways to think about this. Hello, Ashwin. Uh, good morning. <laughs> I think I got that right. Swapping that 3.3 for 3.8 would definitely open it in the right... Uh, version of the documentation. So the question is, which way do I lean that? Uh, because I tend to write my own packages probably in my user package, so in which case I would want Python 3.8. But if I help people in the forum, they're probably still using Python 3.3. I like to make sure I'm not doing something funky. Um, so I could leave it that way. I'm imagining uh, you know, OS, the documentation for os.path.isfile says it changed in version 3.6 to accept a path-like object. So presumably if I had the documentation at 3.8, I would be able to know if something would work in that version. But I don't know what happens if there's something that was added in a brand new version of Sublime that doesn't exist in 3.3. Does it say added in certain version? I don't know. So I'm going to leave that for the time being. But that's the... Uh, this sort of plays into the same thing that we were talking about before. I wanted to be able to quickly search for Python stuff, and it only took a couple of minutes to whip this up. And now my Sublime allows me to do that. I didn't have to install a package. Uh, 
if this was built in, then everybody would have that, and it would be, you know, quote unquote, cluttering up their command palette. But I was able to tune Sublime to exactly the way that I like to work, so that's nice. I'm going to do this in our command here, um, just because I don't like to do that. Uh, and Ashwin's asking, is there a way to know the namespace the command is in, 3.3 or 3.8? Uh, gee, that's a good question. Technically, yes. Uh, specifically because if I did this, uh, did a package report. The default package has plugins, and I know that it's running in Python 3.8. Uh, and the command browser is running in Python 3.8. Command browser 33 is running in Python 3.3. Override audit knows that because it knows where the package folder is. Or if you will, if you did this, any package that has a Python version file in it is something that's definitely, definitely maybe running in version 3.8, uh, in which case you have to open the file to actually see what the value is inside of it uh, because it could still be there but have 3.3 in it, in which case it's still running in the old plugin host. But if this file doesn't exist, then it has to be running in 3.3 because that's the legacy, pardon me, way that the uh, command works. So all else being equal, because we know that the view file name is this, yeah, we, we would know that uh, this is the packages path. So if the current file name is a Python file and it starts with sublime packages path, then the very next thing after that is the name of the package itself. You could check resources to see if that file exists, and then it would know which version of the documentation to jump to. That might potentially be a, a nice tweak to that particular plugin, um, except that I normally write plugins in my user package. So the user package, by definition, always runs in Python 3.3, which or 3.8, I should say, which reminds me. I wonder if I ever tested that. I assume I did. Ah, look at that. There's totally there's totally a bug in override audits package control or override audits package information thing. We should probably jump in and fix that. Oh. Cripes. How did I let that slip through? Um, in case, uh, just because you joined late, what we're doing here is essentially creating a wrapper on the a delete file command that is in the core of Sublime. It's not, it used to be in Sublime 3.3, this was a command that was available in the default package, but now it's in the core, um, which I'm pretty sure um, is, uh, <clears throat> I think that was because there were sort of, speed race conditions with closing files and the git tracking and other uh, tracking that sublime does uh, and ashwin says not sure how it would work for built-in commands oh i see I, I missed a bit there i think it would be handy to have sublime command version command name maybe yeah um that's actually kind of a I sort of, well, I didn't, I'd say I didn't sort of do that. Definitely that's something that would be possible. I would guess if something like that existed, it would probably return none for a built-in command to let you know that it's a built-in command. That's probably how I would implement that. If something is implemented in a Python 3.3 plugin, then it would return 3.3. If it was a 3.8 plugin, it would return 3.8. And if it's a command that exists, I guess that's the other case there. What if what, what happens if you call it with a command that doesn't exist? Um, it, it has to have some sort of return value to let you know I would think that it's a valid command. But I don't know. I would guess that internal commands, if they're running in Python, always run in the most recent host. But hmm, that's an interesting thing to ask Will. Um, so what we're doing is uh, creating a wrapper around the, this is that that built-in command will delete a file if you say prompt false, uh, which is the default here for the one that's in the command palette. It just deletes the file without asking you. Uh, you could override this and set that to true, and then it would ask you. It does so in a dialog box, but we want to be prompted with um, something in the 
in the command palette because I want to add this to the command palette to be able to delete a file without having to have the sidebar open because I you've probably noticed I, I don't tend to use the sidebar a lot. I mean, I guess I'd probably do more in live streams when I'm live and in videos when I record them if there happens to be one uh, because I tend to talk with my hands or with the mouse uh, and it sort of puts on a better visual show. Uh, but when I'm actually just sort of sitting working, I tend to not do that quite, quite as much. Probably still do more than I should though. Um, what GUI does Sublime use, PyQt or TKinter or other? It's other. It's something that is uh, built in-house. It doesn't use uh, any off-the-shelf toolkit. They do. They I believe that last check, and I can't remember if Will mentioned if this was different or not. There's a library called Skya that they use, S-K-I-A, to do all of their compositing. Uh, and yeah, there you go. Ashwin's got you there. And uh, it uh, part of part of the genius of I think Sublime. There there are some native components we should say. Uh, the menu is a native component. The the caption in the window is a native component. But all of the inside they hand compo they composite themselves by hand uh, and then display out, which allows it to work the same across all of the operating systems, you can get it to look the, the same way, except for the operating system specific stuff, which for example means that under Linux, the menus follow the general GTK scheme of the system, which is why I have dark menus, but on Windows they tend to be you know, not dark, and I don't know if there's necessarily a way to fix that. Hello, Nawal, or Nafal, pardon me, I can't read. I got myself a new uh, Switch game the other day, uh, and I was playing on the portable, and I think I've seriously screwed up my eyes because it had tiny writing uh, he says uh, I can't live without sidebars uh, certainly when I'm working on stuff like the web projects at work there is just so much stuff that's so hard to keep everything together in my head uh, I tend to rely on the sidebar fairly heavily in that particular case even when I'm working on say my override audit package um, particularly because of the way I lay out some of the resources I I need to look in there a little bit to see the structure of things uh, but I try not to, oh I don't try not to use it. I just sort of tend to not use it uh, quite as much I think this should do what we want. So I, I threw this in here to capture this in a variable just so that that wouldn't go off a long line. And this is one of those things I struggle. No fall. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't uh, didn't butcher that too badly when I pronounced it. Um, I always run afoul of what looks better or is more Pythonic or whatnot. Um, uh, Having this be two lines like this, calling this variable out and stashing it so that this line is shorter, or using the self.view.file name in place of both of these and having a long line, I bet you nobody likes that, or wrapping it uh, so that's on two lines, but if you do that, then you have to have uh, parentheses at the beginning and the end of the line, which I tend to not like. I think if I had to pick one thing about Python that I'm not super jazzed about it's the fact that the way indent is important for some things and and how that plays into having a longer if condition or something wrapping on the next line isn't something that you can necessarily get going but we don't only want this command to be enabled if it has a file name uh, that is valid it's been saved at least once and it actually exists on disk uh, and the documentation for is file again there points out that uh, this is the version this is the help for python version 3.8 for that because of that thing i just did a second ago but returns true if it's an existing regular file um, so if it's a directory that's not going to do anything and uh good luck opening a directory in a tab i would think um actually i wonder Theoretically, this could actually be used to delete images, too. They don't have a view, but sheets do have a file name. But, you know, that's a task for perhaps another thing. I don't work with images very often because I'm a terrible artist. Uh, I usually just bracket long lines and let the auto format wrap it. Yeah, I, I've done that in some cases, but 
I sort of ride a line. In some of, of my own package, I try to keep uh, – that's why I have two rulers here. The first one, um, hopefully that comes across in the stream. This one's line – Seven, column 79 and this one is column 80 so i try to keep it to the 79 where possible but occasionally i'll let myself slip into the 80 uh, i would recommend pathlib if i am correct for path things in python 3.8 yeah that would probably be the better way to go for something like this uh, and this is again that thing where all of my python knowledge has been gained from using or writing plugins in Sublime, and historically it's always been Python 3.3. So there's probably a lot of cool stuff related in that regard. The benefit to doing it this way, besides the fact that I'm already familiar with it, such as it is, I mean, clearly I had to look it up because I don't do file operations all that often, but uh, that if I can share this with somebody uh, or with people on the forum and they don't necessarily have to have this new build of Sublime uh, because only people with... Uh, that are in the Discord that have access to the new builds are able to run this, the version of Sublime that has Python 3.8 uh, available to plugins, which because this is in my user package is technically possible. Um, so this should do what we want, but what we need is an, uh, I guess what, the first thing that we need to do is change this to actually be something that's not some arg. Uh, let's say confirm, prompt delete command, confirm. I mean, this is sort of a funky way to have gone about doing this, <laughs> uh, such as it is. But I think that's probably a good way to go for that um, because we're gonna call this without an argument. This, this argument is absolutely required because it doesn't have a default. So if you try to execute it without specifying something, it'll fail. Uh, and so because we're going to be in the command palette and we're going to have an input handler, that will allow it to call the input method that we're about to write to invoke the input handler that we're going to write just now so that it can execute its own self again or actually do something or not depending on what you choose. Um, so but this would be called, because the name of the argument is confirm, that would be confirm input handler, and that's a sublime plugin list input handler, because I want to have a yes no kind of operation on this. I'll do that, and uh, eh? we want list input handler class thusly. I'll go ahead and shuffle that over there. It's always handy to actually have a reference to the thing um now let's see we don't need a name method because our class is appropriately named for that but we do need to implement list items that's uh, going to take a self and uh let's see we're going to want to return a list of tuples um confirm delete uh, let's see uh it says confirm and send item to trash and cancel. So we'll just call confirm uh, and that'll be true. And then the other one would be cancel and that would be false. That's going to give us our list items. Uh, let's say we also want to throw a placeholder in here. Uh, thought mm. uh, we're going to do this we're going to when we create this input handler we're going to pass it the file name uh, and then we can do a little bit of that uh, this and again, I could probably use an F string for this, but since we're going the Python 3.3 route, we'll do that instead. Uh, let's see, anything else we need here? We don't need any initial text. Let's leave that empty by default. Maybe we want a preview. Let's see. This one says send item to trash and yeah. Well, let's say, yeah, let's 
let's let's go with that. I mean, as far as simplistic plugins go, why not add a whole bunch of stuff, right? Uh, preview uh, self text value I have here called whenever the user changes the text in the entry box. The returned value, boop, boop, boo. The value argument will be provided when list items return a list of tuples. Otherwise, it's not given. Uh, hopefully, I have that documentation correct. I remember being confused by that at some point in the past when it turned out it didn't work the way that I thought it did. Um, boop, boop, boo. Boop, boop, boo. Uh, what did I say this was going to say? <laughs> Send item to trash. I guess we don't necessarily need it to be. Fancy in that particular way, right? But it's a thing we can do. So what the heck? Uh, and the other one would be cancel. Mm -hmm. Maybe that one should be bold. It's going to be canceled twice. Uh, we'll call it cancel operation, just because it probably makes sense to have something in there. I uh, probably all that is strictly required. So all we got to do now is go like yeah. I guess it might behoove me to do this. It's actually that one. See, so we can actually see what method it is that we're uh, implementing in this particular case. One of the new things in uh, in Snappy in recent versions uh, is that the help is annotated with when certain things were added. Not for absolutely everything because that would be a little busy, but we're pretty close. Uh, Ashwin's saying, I wish links in preview could have could have invoked another method in list input handler just like you have in pop-ups and annotations. Yeah, that would probably be kind of neat. What sort of thing would you use for that? I, I'd actually forgotten that uh, that annotations allow you to do that, and also in um, in the autocomplete panel now too, right? I think the items in there can also have links that you can click on to do something. Uh, but I can't remember exactly. I don't. I don't tend to use those sorts of autocomplete things uh, that often. Um, so, boop, boop, boop. stop that, you. We need to return a confirm input handler for self dot file name. Uh, if input is called, it's because we only have one argument and it's missing. Just do that. Uh, so that's cool. So all we got to do now is. User default commands and prompt delete file is what it's called. So let's see. Oh yeah, I forgot I was working on a example plugin for someone and uh, got stalled out in the middle. Um, just to check here. It's the only Delete server, that's the only thing that actually has delete in the name, right? Cool. Just to make sure that that command doesn't actually already exist in the command palette. Delete and the command, oops, shoot, I messed that up. Prompt delete file, thus. Uh, and Ashwin says, one cool thing you can do is have a link in preview and click it to run a command that implements a dialog API and fills the text input handler with the directory or file path. Yeah, that would be cool. Incidentally, that uh, that plugin that we worked on in the last live stream to uh, open the Camtasia file, grab the table of contents, and insert it directly into the current file made this week's video uh, breeze. It's the fastest that has ever gone. I should really get back to creating the uh, templates that I wanted to uh, put in there to make that even easier than it currently is. Right now my use case is get the details for the last video I made and then modify them as appropriate. All right, so let's see what happens. 
Ne. Uh oh. Shoot. <sighs> Pardon me. We don't care what the value is here. It just has to be. Well, we'll call it none. Because it, it is literally none. But remember, is enabled gets called with the same arguments that the command would be called with. And since it's not being called with any arguments, uh, it doesn't pass in value to is enabled. And unlike the run method, that doesn't trigger anything special. Okay. Let's try that again. Oh, I am, by the way, really loving how this actually works now. Mwah. Uh, to actually fully clear the console instead of just reeling a bunch of stuff off to the make it hidden. That works so cool. Oh. I prefix my command with user just in case. Yeah, I I would I generally recommend that as well if you're working on something uh, to because commands aren't namespaced at all and whichever one is loaded last is the one that will be used. So you definitely want to make sure that you don't clobber anything. That's why, you know, override audit has some really long command names and so does hyperhelp as well. Uh, Ashwin, boss life to write and use your own tools to make life easier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. <sighs> Still broken? No. Um, but here it is. I should probably have named it delete current file or something, huh? Let's do that. Delete current file. Yeah, that seems cool. And I have to train it that I want this one instead of that one. So it's going to prompt me now, theoretically. Uh-oh. Object has no attribute file name. Really? Oh, I forgot. I forgot a view somewhere, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I've been thinking since last uh, last stream about. I definitely like the idea of having a button I can push to pop up a face palm or a woohoo or something. If anybody has any ideas of what that could look like, do let me know, because. I did a little bit of looking to see. Turns out that most people that stream stuff are gamers and they have pop-ups like headshot and fatality and stuff. And hardly anybody has a woohoo, I fixed a bug. You know, we're really blazing a trail here with this thing. Um, okay. Now, though. Now, uh, missing one positional argument value. Are you sure? Really now? Right, I think this is the thing that screwed me up before. I think the documentation is wrong on that thing. Uh, maybe we'll check into that in just a second as well. Delete current file. Delete home T Martin, blah, blah. Confirm, cancel. Do, do, do. I'm going to say cancel, and nothing happens. And then I'm going to say confirm and oop, oh, object has no attribute window. A button for every time I do something like that. In my defense, it, it can be kind of hard to uh, keep the focus on what you're doing while you're providing a running commentary. At least that's what I tell myself. I make the same sorts of dumb mistakes otherwise. The file has been deleted. I think it worked. Boy, that is vividly bright, man. Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, just to test it for surezies, let's go ahead and empty the trash. Yeah, yeah, you empty that right trash. You empty that trash. Oh, I already had that window open. I didn't need to do that. Oops. Shows you how often I use that. I'm going to resurrect it and do it again. Delete current file. Yes. And boop. Cool beans. So that totally does what we want. Uh, close without saving. So that is cool. That operation, 100% successful. We're 50% of the way to never having to use file manager ever again, probably. Um, before we continue any further with that, I'm going to close this window. Bump and just because I'm curious, do, do, do. 
go to this version and text commands. Oh no, sorry, that was a list input handler, wasn't it? Yeah. Oops. Shoot. Do that. There we go. Uh, that was. It says text comma value. I bet you that's not how that works. Can we add a delete which doesn't send to trash? Uh, absolutely. And I think you would probably do something like, uh, whoops, PyDoc. Uh, I'm going to guess it's called unlink. Boop. Bring this over. Neat. This, the, in response to this instead of calling run command delete file giving it the name whoops that's not the thing you could just call os.unlink and give it the path uh, and it will delete the thing permanently which ah, this is identical to remove uh, as a unix person i am more likely to think of unlink as the name for this uh, so see the documentation for remove. It deletes the file path. It's identical to remove the unlink in its traditional Unix name. Please see remove for yeah. Hey, neat definition of recursive. See recursive. Anyway, yeah, if you did that, it would definitely send your file just to oblivion instead of to the trash. Uh, I prefer this for the one time a year where I delete something and realize that I would didn't mean to do that and then I go into the trash folder and there's stuff in there from like 2015 and I wonder how many how many systems have I had of a Linux nature where I just copied the contents of my home directory from one computer to another as I did an upgrade and I carefully carried along deleted files that I forgot were even there <laughs> yeah os.remove and os.unlink would both do that very thing. Um, for safety, uh, I like this one, which also reminds me that override audit uses, could be using this to delete files as well. Uh, probably e slightly easier than what it's currently using. One of the problems with the older version of Sublime that had this as a plugin was they used the send to trash and there was a couple of funky edge cases with it sometimes. And perhaps this actually has those same cases, I'm not sure. Uh, in, on uh, The one that comes immediately to mind is that if you're working on a file that's stored on a network drive, then it can't access the trash folder from the place where the drive actually came from because it's, pardon me, it's a network mount from somewhere else, like a Samba share or an NFS share or something. So it defaults to trying to put things in the dot trash file and the root of the file system. And unless you're root, that's not going to work. Or it chooses a couple of other funky places sometimes as well. It's been a source of never-ending strife. Um, before I forget, oh, sorry, I'm going to go into the lib. Ooh. I'm interested in this. Self arg, self v. Which one is which? Do hmm. do. This is the com. Hmm. Oh right. That would be, wouldn't it? It only takes one argument. I'm not entirely sure how I came up with the idea that it gets a text and a value in that thing, but I should probably fix that because it seems quite uh, quite wrong. Here, maybe we can do this. Open up the actual API documentation and see what it has to say about this. Uh, oh, I guess I could actually click it here, couldn't I? It just says value. The returned value, either plain to, oh. All right. Let's just quickly jump in and uh, tweak that up while I'm remembering it. Uh, so that would be list input handler. Dot t oh, there's probably the same thing as broken for all of them too. We'll just name this thing value like this. I don't think that is uh, 
Otherwise, it is probably the text. It's probably where I got that wrong. Um, in fact, we don't even need to say that because the value is literally the value that the command thing is going to represent. Um, I would imagine that, that it's the text string if you don't use the tuple version. Save that, and there's probably also one in uh, text input handler as well. No, oh, and this one, this one's smarter than that. Cool. All right, don't even need to worry about that. So cool. And that'll be all good. Now uh, let's see. Where is it in here? Yeah. Refresh. Yeah, there we go. Making life better one step at a time. The familiar page. Yeah, that's actually uh, uh one of the one of the cooler. I actually. I should say, one of the first augmentations I did to Sublime was adding links to, the, uh, I think one or two of these might actually be in here by default, but I added API reference. This one is actually probably wrong now. In fact, several of these probably are wrong now, if I had to guess, because, oh, no, I guess not. Um, they open various... Uh, Page. Let's just check that. Oh, I did fix that one. Okay, I I jammed my own stuff in here, but I, I did change the API reference official undocumented bits for. Oh, while I'm here, let's do that. Feature proof ourselves against. how that is now in a new place. So I don't confuse myself later, although observably I don't use these as often as I did way back in the day. It would be nice that they actually work when I do. Uh, so let's see, if I pick that, whoops, that's the wrong one. And pick official documentation index. That does indeed pull up the documentation, so gravy. Don't need that one either. Uh, I used to use those a lot, and then I came up with HyperHelp to put the most post of the help that I tend to use directly in Sublime so that I don't have to jump out to a web page in order to do it. Uh, I find my life a little bit uh, nicer in that regard, because if I look at a browser, I'm likely to check the forum and Stack Overflow, and then I quickly get derailed. Let's not modify anything to do with Sublime Plugin because life would be terrible if I did that. Now, what was that other thing that I noticed that was wrong a second ago? Override audit. Something in here is responsible for uh, the package pop-up and the thing that's doing it is incorrectly thinking that the user package is running in Python 3.3 when it definitely runs in Python 3.8, no matter what. One of the issues that we, we, I definitely remember to add that I mentioned in, I think the last stream was, if you add a Python version file to your user package to try to get it to run in Python 3.8, uh, first of all, don't do that because it always runs in Python 3.8 anyway, uh, but also when you do that, you completely bork the whole plugin system for unknown reasons. So I added an issue. You should never really do that anyway, but you expect the standard use case for something like that would be uh, that it just tells you, hey, don't do that, and not that it breaks things horribly. Um, probably in here, if I had to guess. Maybe I should do that over here in this other window instead. Da, da, da. Uh, no, maybe not. I guess probably the easiest thing to do is this. No, it is in here. Oh. Right, all right. Oh, no. 
My only concern with browsers is the sudden flash of white light. Yeah, I, I tend to not like that either. I imagine that my face gets more shockingly white uh, every time I bring one of those pages over. If you noticed in the last couple of videos, I tried to get around that to some degree by recording myself doing the stuff first and then going back and talking over what I was doing so they didn't have the browser flashing in my face. I don't know that there's necessarily a good way to make pages that are shockingly white like that darker but also uh, I try to keep things looking the way that it would look if somebody else was doing the same thing uh, so that there's a little bit less confusion if you're following along what I'm doing which is why I'm using Mariana as my color scheme now uh, because when the, the new builds become more public that's going to be the default and my videos are going to switch to using this color scheme. So I wanted to get myself more used to it before that happens. Uh, here's the magic of what is doing this. We get the metadata for a particular package. And the only time that, uh, let's go ahead and open a report over here. It could be any report, but we'll use the package report for this one. The only time the hover pop-up tells you what version of Python something is, is if that package has a plugin inside of it, because otherwise it doesn't matter what plugin host it could theoretically run in because there aren't any plugins in it. Uh, for example, ASP doesn't have that line. It just has a link to the packages repository for you to be able to get to that uh, because there's no plugins in that package. But the HTML package down here does have a plugin and it runs in Python 3.8 and that's because all of the packages that ship with Sublime have, that have plugins have bumped themselves up. So this determines if a package contains plugins and if it does it needs to determine the Python version that those things would run inside of which defaults to Python 3.3 because that's how it worked in the legacy context and then if there's a Python version file um, it, this actually returns the content of this thing. It sets the Python version to what's inside of that file. Um, but this file won't exist in the user package. Um, so we probably want something like if this, I would guess, to resolve this. Katrina Johnson, look into a plugin called Dark Reader. Oh, interesting. I'm going to make a note of that over here for my own use. Also, hello. <laughs> Inverts bright colors. Hey, hey. I'm going to leave that over there and play around with that later. Theoretically, this is the only thing that we need to do to resolve this particular problem. So that one's still 3.8. And way down in here, this one is... 3.3 incorrectly because the user package doesn't have um, unversioned too, huh? Nah, that probably makes sense. I'm sure I noticed that. The user package can't have a Python version file and it always runs in the most recent version. Uh. Hmm. Actually, I guess there's another use and there's another. Uh, well, let's just see if this fixes the problem, uh, but it still has a bug. That all reloaded properly, so if I reload this. Yay. Okay, so that totally fixed the problem. Now the user package is says it's running at 3.8, uh, except that if we were to do this in Sublime Text 3, uh, that would be wrong because in Sublime Text 3, it always has to be 3.3 because there isn't another plugin host. Let's see. How does that equals equals become a big equals sign? Did it actually change? Oh, I, oh, I guess it did. Uh, that would be uh, a ligature in my font in that case, I would guess. Same sort of thing that makes this, uh, well, theoretically that. I don't think it works in Python because Python scopes those differently. Let's see. For example, or if there were if there were spaces inside of them, you can tell that they're distinct things. And as I move the cursor through it, 
you can see that it's actually two characters. So, indeed, that's the magic of ligatures if your font supports it. Uh, and my, my particular font is uh, Yosevka Stylistic Set 9. Uh, thus, uh, and I constructed my own version of this. It's a package that it's a it's a freely available font. Uh, the guy that created the font, I really like the way that it looks. He implemented JavaScript that will generate the font files, and it does it programmatically by using mathematical functions to determine to describe the shapes of the characters. I think if I understood it correctly. Uh, so the default version of it was a hair too thin for my taste. It was a very thin, reedy font, which is great if you want to have a lot of stuff on the screen, but I found it hard to follow. So I modified a version of it to make it slightly wider, which is what this one is. And uh, because it's written in Node and it was doing so many mathematical calculations, it was the first time I discovered that the fans in my PC are actually thermally controlled. I just always thought they were really quiet, and it took like six hours to finish. Uh, Ashwin says, fonts like Fira Code, Cascadia Code, have it if you're interested. I personally use Fira Code. Another one that might be interesting is JetBrains Mono. I can't, I think it has uh, that. How about simply not displaying the user plugins version? That would definitely be an easier way to go, but I'm a completionist and wanna, <laughs> I want it to work properly because there are plugins that are in there, unless you meant how it says unversioned. I can't exactly remember. Oh, it's it's distinctly unversioned because it has no version as opposed to other things like, say, the piano package uh, whose version is unknown or this one or this one. Those ones are unknown because they don't have the appropriate file in them. That actually comes from the package metadata, this bit here, which is a file that package control inserts into packages when it installs them, uh, which is the thing that uh, I think I mentioned to Ashwin in the comments on the video uh, yesterday. If a package contains this file, then package control thinks that it's in control of said package, so it will try to update it, uh, and if it thinks it's, if it sees that a package with this file in it and that package isn't in the list of packages that it thinks it installed, it will delete that package and throw it away because it thinks you don't have it anymore as part of the orphaned packages setting. Um, I think I might have a link to the actual version of this font that I'm actually using here. Let's see. I can't remember uh, offhand if I do. But... Uh, I think I might have shared it with somebody else, actually. This thing is really hard to navigate. Um, yeah. It would be in here if I did have it. Whoops. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that, Joe. Is there actually stuff in here? I might just have loose files. Yeah. That's less interesting. Uh, if you hit me up on uh, Twitter or on the Discord afterwards, I can provide uh, a zip file that actually has that in it because it, there's a bunch of, you know, there's the bold, the bold italic, and I there I also have uh, a terminal version of it as well, uh, which I think I'm using in here. Uh, this is the exact same font as up there, but this is the terminal variant, and so that it doesn't have the ligatures in it uh, because you don't want funky stuff in your command line or at least I don't anyway um, in order to check this <laughs> let's try this let's put that back to the way it was um, really it's a string Uh, let's see. Ligatures are really cool if a language supports bit shift augmented operators. Yeah, there was a um, 
I can't remember the name of what font it was, and maybe it's the one that you use, uh, Ashwin, because uh, it might have been. Fira Code is definitely one that I tried, but d ultimately didn't use, obviously. Uh, but I, I tried a bunch of fonts, and there was one that just went absolutely noodle coodle with ligatures to the point where even the www in a url suddenly turned into three tiny w's all tiny and squinched together and uh that one that particular font really turned me off it was incredibly opinionated in how many things should be ligatures so part of the selection of the font was not only do the characters look nice, but is there a, a nice enough set of ligatures without going a little overboard? I think if there are some languages, uh, Haskell comes to mind, I think, that really benefit from having ligatures. Uh, certainly, if you do a lot of JavaScript stuff, you use a lot of arrow functions. It looks really nice in there as well. <sighs> Sublime version returns a string. Sublime version returns a string. Can you compare strings of numbers the same way as you would with numbers? Or would you use int on it? I slightly modified the Python syntax to have different colors for comparison operators so that equals equals and equals are different colors. Ah, interesting. As you had to apply a slightly different scope to it so that you could target it differently, I assume. This information is probably something that we don't need to I'm just thinking, um, we can get back to there quickly, right? Yeah, because for some reason there's a change at the end of that line. Uh, I got a various things up here. I don't have anything, whoops. Don't do that. I don't have anything that's specific to the, you okay, buddy? Yeah. Okay. I think he might have had a bad dream. Shake it off, dude. There you go. Occasionally, he startles himself awake with a snore and such. And then he goes back to sleep. He's a cute little butt. Um, what was I saying there? Uh, I don't have anything in here that's very that's specific to the build. Um, but I could. Mm -mm -mm. I slightly modified the, yeah I the new builds of sublime actually make that kind of easier now I think you can extend an existing syntax and just sort of replace little bits of it as you need to have your own customized version and I think the scope is already different and only the color scheme needed to be changed. Yeah, uh, possibly. I mean, oh, we can actually check that right here. Uh, well, maybe not inside of a comment, genius. Thanks. Uh, the scope on this is operator assignment, and that one's operator comparison. So yeah, if you're using, well, you could, you could target those with different scopes in the color scheme and not have to worry about that at all. Ideally, the third level scope for both should be different. Yeah, there you go. And it totally is. Uh, and I, it is right now. Anyway, I guess I should say, I don't, I imagine, I don't think Python has been rewritten since, uh, since these builds came out. I think only what JavaScript and of the default packages, JavaScript was done uh, using some new stuff, and now there's changes to the Java package that DeathX did, uh, which are I don't I don't know if those have actually been merged in yet or not. I follow the I can't I, I follow the issue repository and read the stuff, but I don't I don't necessarily follow the stuff where PRs are merged, only issues. 
So that may or may not be the case. Um, did I already do that once? Yeah, I did it down there. Don't do it again. Okay. Something like that, right? So the user plugin version is going to be 3.8 if the build of Sublime is 4,000 or greater, even though the first public build was only 40, 50. So chances of that are remote, but it makes for a nice even number. Otherwise, it's going to be 3.3. Uh, this would be determine what version of Python. Oh, sorry. Determine what plugin host the user package runs in, which is always 3.3 in Sublime Text 3 builds, but is in the newer 3.8 host in 4K build series. Not for nothing, but it's kind of tricky at this current state of development to refer to Sublime Text as sublime text without putting the four in the name because we're used to referring to it in the general case and now there's a distinction uh, java will probably get a rewrite courtesy of death x c sharp has had a rewrite probably rust haskell Lisp as well yeah i think uh keith was working on some stuff in c sharp as well too a, a couple of tweaks anyway i think he did the majority of one of the last rewrites or he wrote the tests I can't quite remember it seems like so long ago that particular thing um, I think I've mentioned this in streams but I've always wanted to get more into syntaxes and helping in the default uh, repository the default packages helping with writing stuff and helping people and jumping more into the issues repository helping people there but I think my strengths are more in the this sort of area and helping people in the forum and Stack Overflow and Discord than that aspect. I'm not quite as good at those, but I'm hopefully passable at this. Uh, so I think we all have our own, you know, sort of niche to fill, such as you will. Let's see. Correct me if I'm wrong, but variables should be double underscored and function single if you're trying to make them kind of private-ish. I believe the magic of this is anything that has a single underscore isn't automatically uh, included if you say import star from, but you can still import it if you want to. And two underscores means that it's absolutely module private and there's no way to get at it uh, via an import is my understanding of that. Uh, so I... For my own purposes, I I tend to make my globally module private-ish things underscores, single underscores, because I do need to import them from other places. But if there was two, uh, then I wouldn't be able to. Uh, and well, I guess in this particular thing, this act, this packages folder, I can actually. Uh, this is one of the places where I actually have you know sidebar action. Uh, the lib folder is where various things like this thing that this file that has everything to do with knowing information about packages and their contents, uh, simple utilities, the thing that manages the output views to be able to generate reports nicely. The standard list of metadata information for packages that uh, are shipped with Sublime, which is theoretically one of those things that could possibly change at some point. So I got to remember to keep my eye on that as well. Uh, oh, and Ashwin says he added added support for pattern matching. Yeah, I my my pet name for Keith is the Syntax King. He but he had more free time to to work on that stuff a couple of years ago than he has has now. Sadly, he's a busy busy guy. Uh. So theoretically, that should do something, right? Uh, the Python version is the version of the user plugin if the package name is user, which always has to be that case. I mean, yeah. Uh, otherwise, 3.3. 3. 
Funny thing, and this is something that I tested way back when I originally wrote Override Audit on Linux. Yeah, the file system is absolutely case sensitive. Get something wrong, uh, like naming default, default with a lowercase d or more than one uppercase letter, uh, you end up with a different package. On Windows, there was a weird mix at the back at the point where uh, some parts of the core were case sensitive and some weren't. Uh, and it was sort of a weird, it was a brain buster working my head around that one back in the thing, but I, this should be safe based on my recollection. And it's pretty low key anyway. So our changes here are that and that. So let's go ahead and reload that. That totally worked. And I think, and it's the only way to test this. Oh, this is actually in my link directory, right? Yeah, okay. Um, where's that report? I'm gonna refresh this and 3.8, cool. Let's give this a jingle. Probably only need one of those. Uh, yay! That totally works. And just to verify, uh, does this stuff actually appear in here? Yes. So Sublime 3 is still using this. I, I, can, I think I might have mentioned I took the, I bit the bullet and split my Sublime 3 and Sublime 4 data directories apart uh, because package dev kept on your package control kept uninstalling parts of package dev whenever I flipped back and forth. So we good. Now as an added benefit, I can run them both simultaneously and not mess up my thing. So that's cool. I should probably commit this as well while I'm remembering. Uh, I probably shouldn't be on that branch though. The last thing I did was release stable. Uh, let's say we actually should do something like this, I suppose. V223, because that's probably going to be the next version. I can always rename it as desired. And we'll stage that. Mm. Oh, shoot. Fix the version of Python displayed for user. Um, and we would say just something real simple like, ow. The Python version displayed for the user package should be 3.3 if you're oops, using Sublime Text 3 and 3.8 if you're using uh, Sublime Text 4 build. This makes sure that this, that the version is always correct. based on your running version, instead of having it hard-coded, which would otherwise be a bad idea. And that is totally not how you spell that. And good to go. And if I did that, um, what I should probably also do is just some quick tweaks here to make sure that I remember. Change this to three, because that's going to be what the next version is. I'll look at how the sausage is made. When's this version going to be released? We don't know. And boop. Correct the version of the user of the user packages Python user package. Pardon me. Python interpreter, the newer builds 
of Sublime. I'm going to copy that. That part's good. We need to add the messages.json. Cram a line in here too. To make sure that version is all set up. And the change log needs to also have something like that and something like that. And we come back to here. I'll just very quickly stage that, stage that, and get my track file, stage that, amend that commit, and switch back to this branch. Hmm. Yeah, well, we'll go back to that one. That's definitely in the next build. It doesn't necessarily have to be running for me. I'm aware of what version I'm running. So all good. And get back to what it was that we were doing, such as it is. Although that did take a little bit of time. I did say that I just sort of wanted to play with random plug-in-y type stuff. So, all good. Next uh, item on the list. We did this. Now, the other thing that uh, I wanted to work with, and we'll see I only have about a half an hour here, is its ability to create new files. Now, I don't know how well the status bar shows on this but it has text there that says creating at home t martin config sublime text packages user um, because that's the directory of the current file you know i like to keep my commit message in past tense like fixed instead of fix i am generally very prolific in my commit message and, and super verbose although you probably know that if you watch videos i tend to to give the full details but I probably go 50-50 fix or fixed for something like that. I think I tend to write my commit messages as if this fixes the problem. I don't necessarily tend to write it in the case of what tense it would be if I look at it later. I never really thought about that before. That's interesting. Um, let's fix this too because that's going to bug me. Um, so... This is for creating a file. Now, it's going to try to create it in my user package right now. Uh, and any folders that you specify in here, like if I put stuff slash bob.txt, it will actually create a folder named stuff in my user package and then create a bob.txt file inside of it. Uh, but what I tend to use this for is new file relative to current view. Um, which is kind of doing the same thing in this particular case, but uh, the dollar here is a special variable that represents the location of the current file because I find it easier in my head to think of the fact that this is going in this direction because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. I could say slash temp bob if I wanted to and then bob.txt and it will actually create a file named that in my temporary directory. Um, but I tend to use here for this to, to let that go. And I think there might be other variables that you can use in there. Um, and specifically for cases of things where I'm using the sidebar and I have a file open. Say, for example, a node thing. There are so many subdirectories and I'm doing something here and I want another file related to this one. Uh, I can just hit the thing. Whoops, not that one, though. Pardon me. I hit the thing and say that. Uh, and get prompted. It could actually be just new file if I didn't want it to be that. I actually named it that because I was using another package that did the same thing, and I replaced that package with file manager. Um, but this actually does auto-completion stuff as well. So it seemed like it would be a fun thing to play with, uh, to be able to do something like this. I mean, file manager does this. There's a package called advanced new file that does it as well. So uh, I don't know if it does it exactly this way, but it does stuff. But, you know, I like I said, I am the kind of guy that likes to implement my own stuff. And that's how I learned how to do all of this, by just playing with stuff so I could see. Um, so a window command is what you would want for something like this or a text command, one of the two. Um, I imagine if I had... A window like yaw that had absolutely no files open in it um, when you hit the key 
the default is your home directory. So the defaults to your home directory or to the directory of the current file. Now what might actually be interesting here uh, would be, oops, if I did this, to add that to this, if I did it now, Oh, sorry, this one, that's the one I was testing with. Then it selects the currently open folder, the first one that's in the list. So something like that, good to go. Oh, what, I missed a thing here. Uh, I would like a warning when a new folder is created. I make folders by typo sometimes. Do you use a package, this package or one similar to it to create folders like that? I think one of the more common feature requests on the tracker is something to be able to drag and drop uh, files and stuff in the sidebar to move them around. Uh, but that's one of those things that hasn't traditionally been super exciting for me personally. And I think it's because of that whole, I, I generally prefer to use the command line and, and tab completion for stuff because I spent so much time doing it that way. I just sort of trained my brain. So I... I sort of rebel against that sort of thing. Uh, fun fact, I mean, Visual Studio Code does have the ability to do that, and I have spent some time uh, watching some coworkers work, and every time they need to move a file around, you know, there was a process we were doing where it processes a file and then moves it to uh, a completion directory, and then in order to test it again, you've got to move the file back to where it started. And it seemed like a pretty complicated affair of copying and finding the right place and pasting or dragging and dropping when uh, I just click over to the right, hit up arrow in my terminal, and hit a key, and the file is back. But, I mean, that is very much... Uh, one of those personal preference types of things, right? We all have the different ways that we like to work. Not necessarily one's not necessarily better or worse than anything else. It's just different. Like how I prefer Linux, some people prefer macOS, some people prefer Windows. We all have the way we like to work. So there's there's room enough for everybody to have have their way. Um, there was a time way back when that I would be like, oh, Mac OS, bah. but now I've reached a point in my life now where I'm like, yeah, if using Mac OS is the thing that you want, then cool, because you're, you're doing something, you're being productive. That's really all anybody needs, the, the tools they need to get their work done, have fun, you know, stay productive. It doesn't really matter which ones that they are. You tend to gravitate towards the tools that work best for you, right? Um, so with that information, I'm going to say we want a window command for this, just because there doesn't need to be a version of this command for every file that exists. Um, and then it can, opening an input panel is very easy to do. Um, the tricky part, I guess, is in... Uh, getting the folder and displaying in here and tab completing. Uh, so let's see uh, what we got. Uh, sidebar drag and move is kind of dangerous, kind of accidental for me. Yeah, <laughs> I've done that a time or two myself. Oh, definitely on, on Windows, I'm happier about the recycle bin being there because I tend to click and drag the wrong thing to the wrong place. <laughs> And then, man, are you unhappy? I'm assuming there's no such thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this one a window command. Yeah, I don't know how to complete that. Oh, uh, one of the ideas I had for a plugin is auto completion for Sublime Text plugin classes, terms, and methods based on knowing that the file exists inside of a package folder. Got to get on that sometime. It'll be easy enough to swap this as we need it. Um, run. Shouldn't need anything special. Uh, I guess.
We're going to say that our command takes a file name, but it defaults to none. And in that case, we need to actually prompt the user for the file they're going to open. Otherwise, we could actually just do something with the file. So we could say, um, if file name is done, then something. Otherwise, print doing something with percent %s, say, for example. And blom. The window turned slightly transparent when you started dragging it. Is that something Linux specific? Uh, yes, yes it is. It's one of the features of my window manager. Uh, it turns on translucency when you're dragging so that you can see where you're dropping stuff. Or I guess if you wanted to, you could quickly peek underneath. If I click and hold the mouse for a second, it does the same thing. That's not something that I've traditionally had installed, but a couple of months ago when I got this new computer, it has a Quattro Pro something something super fancy video card in it, which was already deprecated by the time we got it, but it's a high-end server graphics workstation kind of card. So I figured, eh, what the heck, I got CPU cycles, which is why I can now uh, use hardware encoding on the stream as well. I would like an input handler rather than an input panel. Uh, that would be handy for this too, but uh, I don't know how long ago was that, like a month, two months ago? The thing that we want to do here with the tab completion is impossible in an input handler. You can't have a key binding that knows that it's in the input of the command palette, I don't think. Or, I'm sorry, you, you can. You can do that. You can determine that the input is at least in an overlay, if not necessarily that one. But you can't have access. You don't get access to the view that it's inside of. I can't remember what it was that I was doing at the time, but it's it's a thing that I sort of investigated and determined that it did not work uh, as well as one might like. Uh, one of my self projects was converting commands which invoked input panels into input handlers. I have a couple of those myself. For example, scratch buffer. Uh, this is, oh, actually I might have, I think I actually did this one. Oh yeah. This is an example. I, I did this one way, way back uh, when the command palette and input, or not the command palette, when input handlers were just added. I, it might have even been a development build. This particular thing is on my scraps repository, by the way. Um, uh, and the original version of it used a quick panel to do the display. Uh, and then... Uh, input handlers came in so I modified it so that it will use an input handler if you're using a new enough build otherwise it falls back to the other one and this could actually be made smarter now because what this is actually doing is finding all of the syntaxes uh, and then for some of them it has to grab the name out and uh, you'll notice uh, this particular one shouldn't necessarily be in the list uh, but there's a new API function that's added was added back in like 4050 or something um, as a build that lets you know the syntaxes, like sublime dot list syntaxes, I think it's called. Pardon me, um, which provides all sorts of uh, information for stuff. It has the name of the package and uh, the actual scope that it's used, so that you can reverse look up a, file, a, a syntax based on the scope that it has. So there's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, this is an example of uh, the scratch buffer plugin. Uh, Ashwin says uh, it's a lifesaver. Is uh, a fancy way to uh, or a, a thing that I made because I spent so much time uh, helping people with stuff on the forum where the syntax needed to be a certain thing. Like, hey, how come this HTML thing doesn't display correctly or stuff? And you copy the text out and paste, and then you have to set the syntax, and then it's not a scratch buffer, so you try to close the file and you get prompted and it's a big pain in the butt. Uh, so I saved a quite a bit of time with that as well. Uh, Ashwin says, I believe completions are disabled for views that have a is widget setting. Yeah, uh, I think so too. And uh, definitely in the, the uh, this one down here, the input handle input in the console has that uh, disabled internally and you can't re-enable it. There's a setting that turns it on and off, but it's like hard coded to be off in here, according to John. Uh, there's discussion about that on 
on the Discord a ways back. One of the ideas for a plugin I had was being able to auto-complete stuff in here, uh, but it turns out mm, I'm afraid not so much. Even that mini autocomplete would be kind of neat in there, even if it didn't pop up the whole panel. Um, now, what is this thing supposed to be doing? It's supposed to be showing an input handle with some stuff. So let's say they... Maybe something like yaw. Uh, and... We'll do that for the time being. Um, I guess we might say self.window.show input panel. And caption, what's this one called? I'll say, whoops, don't do that. That would be new file. And the initial text is going to be, let's say, empty for the time being. And then none, none, none. So that will pop up and do something. So a file name is none, return self.file prompt. Don't need a semicolon. Spent a lot of time doing TypeScript today. You should probably try mini autocomplete in there. I think I did, and it it did not work. Uh, certainly, you can't summon the autocomplete panel anyway. But I think the the this is this is Python, right? So in theory, um, is there a yeah, that's not an autocomplete we want. Class is an example of something that would trigger out into a bunch of stuff as a snippet. So in theory, if we had the word class in here, uh, it would oops, it would jump, but it doesn't. And the key for automatically summoning the autocomplete doesn't work either. So I'm not sure that that actually works. Do you know offhand what the name of that setting is? because it's a hidden one, and I've only played with it once way back when. I think it's listed in the Discord somewhere, though. Um, is there more than one of those? Yeah. Oh, I need to do more stuff for that. But uh, in any case, these are default commands. Create new file. And is that actually what I called that? Yes, yes, it is. Thus. OK, so in theory. weirdly positioned at the moment and stop right on okay so that totally works um for the purposes of that now one of these things is going to be the on done on change on cancel right uh, what do these all take a single string i guess the magic of this is that you sort of have to keep this around right Let's try it in this view and see. Do, do, do. That is totally the business. So How much have you actually played with that as uh, a day-to-day -day thing? Because I only played with it for a little bit, but then John mentioned that it was an experiment and it probably would go away, so I never played with it more after that. But it does seem like it could be useful in some instances. Uh, let's see. That would probably be... Not the context, not the main... Nope. Uh, you. What did I call that? 
I'll try putting it in here and see what happens. I think the problem with this, such as it is, is that it doesn't have a source of completions to be able to pull the autocomplete from. Um, I'm going to separate that down for a second there. Uh, ba -ba -ba. This might have to be turned on for that to work too. But that also does not work. Oh, <laughs> Uh, Ashwin says, I haven't played with ST4 at all. I just have copious notes of stuff when I buy a license to try out. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, all the more reason to, you know, for people that are, you know, core, hardcore, bleeding edge people to have version three or round two. Uh, three, round two. Yeah, that's, that's an unfortunate way of saying that. Uh, I try to verify everything I say works in both versions and not necessarily the one that I use as my day-to-day. -day. Yeah, the the price differences for third world countries, yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, stuff about, you know, there, that's a sort of a common thing that happens in the forum. I definitely, you know, feel for that sort of thing. And, you know, there are some people that unhelpfully say all you have to do is, you know, put aside a dollar a day for, you know, 80 days or whatever, and then you're like good to go. But that's the sort of advice that's easier to say than give possibility wise. That's like telling someone like me that's overweight that all you have to do is eat more and and exercise eat less and exercise more and suddenly you're skinny that's easy enough to say the real reality of that doesn't necessarily play out uh, do i not use any code linters i do not i don't have uh, any code linters or formatter beautifiers or code intelligence tools like lsp uh, anything that i use that's autocomplete related is just directly in the core of sublime Primarily, that's because I'm a curmudgeonly old man who's been programming for 35 years and way back when, actually probably longer than that now because I don't necessarily know how old I am, um, but uh, way back then, those sorts of things didn't exist, so it's a very ingrained habit uh, that to sort of, you know, using autocomplete to pluck symbols that I've already used, but getting real-time or near real-time notifications that I probably meant something else tend to irritate me more than anything else. I don't know if that means my code quality suffers to any degree. I did make a concerted effort to use Flake 8, I think it was, to uh, verify that the code in my package was um, correct as far as PEP8 is concerned, but uh, I had a very vocal disagreement in my head with code conventions and did not like it. <laughs> Sad. Yeah. Well, you know, old people. But, you know, like I said uh, previously, everybody's got their own way of working. So, I mean, if I if I had to use something long enough, maybe I would get familiar with it. Certainly at work, we're working on a Node.js application that is company-wide. It has a lot of uh, people working on it in a lot of teams. So they have enforced code style with a code prettifier and enforced linting on build and also in pre-commit hooks to make sure that everything is kosher. And personally, I don't find that it makes my life better. I find that it makes my life much, much worse as a result. Um, I did for a long time use the TypeScript package that was built by Microsoft, which sort of had some of that, you know, the linting. And I, I think it did some sort of fiddling with the autocomplete, uh, but their syntax definition wasn't all that great. And I found more often than not, 
if there was a benefit to it telling me that I did something wrong, like I missed a, I misspelled a method name or something, I there was more time spent being upset that I started typing the name of a function. I as soon as the first part of it was done, immediately the rest of the file turns red because the code's not valid. And then you type in the braces and then slowly it fixes itself back. Uh, so I found that visually jarring. Uh, and it's it's stuff for input or sort of for imports at the top of the file. It would often uh, get mad and say such a module doesn't exist. And then I'd fix the module and it would insist that such a module doesn't exist. And the only way to clear it was to kill the server and restart it. And uh, I found that personally that took me a w out of the whole you know workflow of getting stuff. It definitely did not help me. Of course, that is completely down to the quality of the thing that's doing that, right? Not necessarily the technology, but on the whole, it it didn't seem to add much for me. Uh, let's see. Uh, I believe many autocomplete tends to find agreement with people that get used to that terminal-based completions. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, also, you could specify your own format in Python like I do. Uh, indeed, yeah, there was. I spent some time with Flake 8 trying to fiddle stuff around, uh, and eventually I just sort of gave. It had. There's a couple of things that I like to do that it considered completely unreadable, and I couldn't figure out why. Like having a comment that had. Like. Uh, I like to separate sections of longer files with something like this um, because I'm a thousand years old and this is how we used to do it back in the day. Uh, but Flake 8 did not like this. Or maybe it didn't like that, uh, but probably it didn't like this because uh, there's too many things at the start of this line and there should only be one comment character. Or maybe it didn't like this because the comment character and the next character shouldn't touch. Or maybe it didn't like this because it was 79 characters and comment shouldn't be that long. I, ca I can't quite remember, but yeah, it was sort of a... Eh. I, just, I, I want my code to look like what I want. <laughs> I can understand feeling you can customize it. Yeah. I found uh, a lot of people in the last... A couple of months, uh, it seems like a lot of people were jumping into Python development with Sublime and using Anaconda, and it has a linter by default, and they didn't know what it was, and they didn't like it. And so there's like a, a large spate of, of issues with people saying, what the hell are these white boxes all over my code? How do I make them go away? And like, sort of a, a funny, you know, like, I'm not a fan of of linters by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely they are helpful for a lot of stuff. I bet you, again, you know, I'm a I'm an old fuddy daddy. Way back in the day, there used to be C linting tools, and I don't think they were free. Way 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 back when, you know, pri pre open source type stuff, and it was always the sort of thing you had to have money to get. And I was lucky enough that I scraped together enough change to over a period of time to buy myself a copy of Turbo C. So. I would try that in my own format. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, you should let, let me know how that goes and if you solved your problem as well. Um, oh, we're almost running out of time here. Let's just do a little bit more here and then I think we probably have to call it because I have stayed up until 1 a.m. for too many days in a row. And as a result, I'm kind of groggy and having headaches. But what we have now uh, is a new file command. Mm so many new file commands, including this one from November, uh, which opens the thing down there. And when we type something in, uh, it's it should say it's doing something with it. It's not actually not because we're not handling any of these things yet. Um, but one thing we do want to do is this. And then we could say, I wonder how much I could get used to the mini autocomplete <laughs> popping stuff up like that because that that stops the uh well it doesn't stop that panel from popping up anaconda oh anaconda longer by default is annoying yeah and <laughs> definitely it, it seems to be configured in a way that at least recently makes people that are unfamiliar with it very angry in sort of a weird way 
is something that I was pondering earlier in the Discord when there was discussions about different tools for different people. I, I, I definitely agree. Like I prefer Sublime. If there's somebody else that prefers Visual Studio Code, that's absolutely fine. There's enough world for everybody. I don't begrudge anybody their tools. I happen to not like it, but that's no, never mind. What actually bothers me about that situation is that if you that if someone wants to use a tool or a library or anything like that, they find somebody and ask them, and whatever that person says, they just say, okay, well that must be the answer. That's the thing I need. And their search stops right there. And then they try real hard to make the thing that they found do what they want to do. And it, it can be tricky if that's not a good fit. Uh, but if you were to keep looking and see, well, what else could I do? What else does this thing? Maybe you'd find something that works even better for you and would be a better experience and you'd learn more and you'd learn better and you'd learn faster. We tend to get stuck in the first suggestion for stuff. And I think Anaconda kind of falls into that category of there's enough blog posts now that have been written over the last four or five years that say, are you doing Python development in Sublime? You probably want the Anaconda package that people are just finding it and installing it and it doesn't give them a good experience. And then they, it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. You know what I mean? For Sublime, like this isn't a good package when realistically maybe a, there's a different package that does the same thing or one of the settings in it might work better for a person, but they just use the default or they configured it the way that the blog post did. So the thing that bothers me most about that sort of thing is less that there's something that's quote unquote better and more that people seem to settle on things without trying, if you know what I mean. Oh, it's def it's especially annoying if you use tabs by default because everything is white boxed. <laughs> I am not a tab man. Uh, I will say that. Uh, one of the more confusing things to me when I switch Sublime back into uh, the default state is my Python files are uh, tab indented instead of space indented. Uh, and it's weird. Um, I'm going to say the, the return value of show input panel gives you the view of the actual input widget itself. And we can set settings in that if we want to, just like any other view, because it's just a regular view. Uh, anytime show input panel is called, the settings are wiped afresh. So you have to do set a setting every time, but that's good because that makes sure that since only one plugin can display the input panel at a time, that they have control over the settings that are used. And if we did that, uh, then we should be able to say new file event listener and we might say that that's a sublime plugin that uh, view event listener I might have to play with this uh, mini autocomplete thing for a little bit and see what I think of it but then I'm afraid that John might decide that he doesn't want to keep it around um, sorry we want a class method that is applicable settings dot get user new file and uh, I already broke my prescription about having single quotes everywhere instead of double quotes crunk uh, nope the default value for that one should be false thank you very much um, so this input handler is only or event lister rather is only enabled for thing views that have that particular thing hello Ben uh, going well-ish. I totally managed to create the world's simplistic wrapper around an existing command that probably you were the one that created, the, uh, the delete file command. I created a plugin that wraps it so that it can prompt me if I want to delete or not in the command palette instead of with a dialog box, uh, because I'm used to using a package that does it that way. And I have a, I have a trigger finger for hitting a certain sequence of keys when I know I want to delete a thing and it doesn't quite work right if I have a dialog box there. And I've talked a bunch and fixed a bug and override on it. But other than that, what sort of exciting things have happened, guys? <laughs> One thing I don't like about Sublime plugins is that most are not named like clearly enough that you can search what you want and actually find it. Yeah, that is true. Uh, that's probably a, a thing that's more 
packagecontrol.io's ability to search for packages is maybe not as full featured now as it could be or something, which is entirely something that can be solved because the entirety of the web page is actually in a public repository on Will Bond's GitHub profile. And he welcomes people making the site better and creating PRs because he doesn't have as much free time uh, to do stuff. What with his uh, super cool dream job of working at Sublime HQ and stuff. Kind of like Ben. <laughs> Look at you. Are you uh, are you working at the moment, Ben? <laughs> uh, I spent a part of my afternoon watching some friends live stream glass sculpting before uh, while I was doing stuff before my wife got home. <sighs> and then that's actually one thing that I could continue to watch streaming while she's around because she likes them too. But on the whole, I can't watch like people play D and D and stuff while I'm just sitting doing sort of you know boring stuff over here. It's the sad maker. Um, kind of forgot where I was going with this now. I think I wanted an on context for this. No. You think file name is what I want here, do you? I don't think that's true at all. I think I want something more like that. Uh, ben is indeed working, and I kind of like like have how VS Code auto recommends the most basic plugins. Oh, like slash hate, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the another issue that comes up from time to time is Sublime having a panel like a welcome dialogue and and such, which I'm personally not a fan of. But as long as such a thing had that checkbox in the corner that you can uncheck that says show me this at startup so I don't see it. Every time I use Visual Studio proper uh, on a new system, that's the first thing I do. Um, I think the only thing that I the only software I use that has one of those welcome panels that I actually leave enabled is my video editing software because it has a recently used thing on the right for uh, videos and it's easier for me to find it there than to manually browse to it because it never remembers where it saves its files. OK. Um, well, we are kind of out of time here now. I looked it up and I did indeed move the delete file command to core because the sent to trash Python module didn't support dialogues. Oh, interesting. One thing I was sort of curious about is how in the context menu for the sidebar, the default value for, whoops, the default value for prompt is false so that it'll delete a file without asking you first, which is fine for me, particularly since it puts things in the trash. But I'm almost surprised that uh, it's there for folder, but it's not there for for file as a default. That that's not like a setting, uh, which is, I mean, usability-wise, I prefer it this way. Um, but by the same token, I also really like the way uh, in in merge, you have to click the unstage button or the delete button twice in succession to get it to trigger instead of being a shown a dialogue. I think that's an awesome usability thing, but someone was com complaining in the forum recently about how it's, it's really easy to click that button twice when you didn't mean to, uh, particularly, I guess, for clicking delete when you double clicking delete, when you meant to click unstage. So they wanted an extra, uh, prompt in there to remind them that they're doing a thing. Which I guess makes sense after a fashion. Um, I've never had that problem myself, but I actually kind of eschew key bindings in merge in favor of using the mouse specifically to slow myself down so that I'm a little more uh, circumspect in what it is that I'm doing in there. If I have to take an extra second to move over and click a button, that's an extra second for my brain to realize I probably shouldn't be pressing that button. <laughs> Should be prompt true. Yeah. Um, definitely easy enough to tweak if you like it that way. 
I like that it's actually a parameter that's on the command so that you can turn it off if you want, because it made this thing ridiculously easy to implement. Uh, if it always prompted you no matter what, then I wouldn't be able to do something cool like this. So that just proves that there's a lot of cool ways to get around with this sort of stuff. Uh, we pretty much have to end the stream soon, but I want to get just a, a, a bit done here. Um, I did a little bit of checking. In File Manager, when you get this dialog and it has this tab completion, if you log commands, this command that it's executing is a replace region command that it's executing, pardon me, to swap or replace bits of the buffer. But it also logs inserting a tab. So I think he's listening for on on post text command to know that a tab was inserted uh, and then it has to undo the tab and do the thing. I think it's cleaner to have it as a context on an actual key binding. I don't know. What do you guys think? It may still prompt for other things, even with prompt set to false. Sometimes we can't move a file to trash. So we ask if you want to permanently delete it. Oh, neat. Yeah, that's totally uh, that's totally kosher. There's there are some things that should not be you know pencil whipped away, if you will. I would totally expect that. Incidentally, since you're here, what does it handle properly? The idea of files that are on file shares, because I think traditionally the send to trash had a problem with being able to access the appropriate trash folder for a file share. I always used to end up with not being able to delete files because it happened to be mounted in a certain way that made it think that it couldn't put it in the normal trash and it had, oh, I guess not necessarily a file share either, now that I think about it. Um, directories that are mounted on physical devices that are different from the device that holds your user folder or your home folder or the folder that has your profile information or what have you. Uh, because I think the, um, the magic of sending stuff to trash under Linux is that it has to send the file to the trash folder. And it does it by renaming the inode instead of actually moving the file. At least it, it tries to do that. And you can't rename a file across mounts. So it would try to at least one version of the library would try to put it in the trash file related to the actual partition that that particular file, part of the file system was mounted on. And there's not usually a trash folder associated with that. So it would come up with a stupid default that doesn't exist and then blow up in your face or incorrectly infer what your user ID is and generate a folder that has the wrong permissions. I think I saw that happen once too. Actually, I delete files through my view, and as they're open, I get a prompt to save the file when trying to close, which kind of restores the deletion. Indeed. On Windows, it's equivalent to detect deleting the file in Explorer. On Linux, we're using GTK to move the file to trash. Ah, swank. I, I should have realized that whatever you're doing behind the scenes is just going to have a the appropriate hook for something like that. I imagine GTK has solved the problem. If not, you at least don't run into the situation where you behave differently than other things. Deleting a file while it's open. I kind of like the idea that you can resurrect a file after you've deleted it if it's still open by pressing save. <laughs> I think somewhere there's a plugin or a package that detects that situation. And when you delete the file, it closes the tab. There might even be a setting for it now in the new builds. I'm not sure. I think we should probably call it. That's why we moved away from sent to trash. Yeah. I, I had a vague recollection that some mention was made in the Discord about 
the library maybe like holding file locks too long or something. It also means we can move things to trash and merge. Ooh. Does that mean if you double click the uh, delete button, it actually goes to your recycle bin? I wonder if the uh, the guy that was mentioning that, I can't, I, know, I can't remember, maybe it was in the forum, maybe it was in the Discord, maybe it was in an issue. If his file went to the recycle bin, maybe he can get it back. I kind of like that idea. One of the things I need to do in Override Audit is use this command to delete instead of send to trash for deleting overrides because uh, I'm, I'm importing it from the default package to be able to do that but I like the way this works better. There's something about it being a native command that makes it seem like it's so much snappier and faster than slow old Python you know on the order of a millisecond instead of or a microsecond instead of a millisecond or something along those lines on a on a computer that's a thousand times faster than the very first computer I worked on way back in the day where I used to brag to my friends that I had 80 kilobytes of memory in my system and they only had 64 kilobytes in their Commodore 64 yeah I, I was the cool kid who got a computer because they the company went out of business <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I think we should call it here. I have gone a little bit long. It's been a fun stream. We got some stuff done. We're probably going to continue this in the next, next week's stream, which, uh, has been knows has been, uh, fully, uh, scheduled out for the remainder of November. And for anybody that wasn't here at the beginning of the stream, uh, plans for doing, uh, a stream every Tuesday uh, unless something funky comes up throughout the week in which case it would probably be bumped to Wednesday instead or something uh, for the remainder of November and then December what happens then we might try the thing that we did back in 2018 of a uh, live stream a day every day for an hour for November uh, which was the year that I worked on the remote build system uh, plug-in uh, which, you know, basically was a way for me to work on C sharp code here on my Linux box. And when I hit build, shuffle it automatically over a network connection to my laptop over there, build it and run it and re pipe the results back to me here uh, until I got sick in the middle and was unable to do it. I'm thinking of doing something like that again, not that particular package, mind you, but just that general idea. Um, so I don't know if I can pull it off, but Maybe it's interesting to give it a jingle. Uh, so if you have any ideas for packages or plugins, uh, an idea for something that could be done in a month, or an idea of 31 things that could be done in an hour uh, would be the perfect thing for something like that. Uh, I would have I been able to finish that whole month out too, except that I got ridiculously sick uh, to the point where I was unable to actually talk. I was either coughing or when I wasn't coughing, my voice did not make any noise. Uh, and that is like the, the worst cold that I had gotten for probably eight or nine years. So it really knocked me on my butt. Uh, but I really liked the idea of doing it. It was sort of a fun little uh, evening thing, jumping on and working on a little bit of stuff. Uh, and then running away like a madman. And sure, it was a way to make sure that I didn't have to do the devlog uh, by writing it. Because, hey, I recorded it as a video and people could watch it if they wanted to. I think we should probably call it a night there. So uh, thanks so much for watching. We will be back next Tuesday at the same time. Um, watch the Twitter. Uh, I do not have... Uh, the appropriate uh, lower thirds set up for that yet. Uh, and uh, you will know when I'm going live. You can always subscribe and uh, hit the bell notification icon. You'll get warnings that I am about to go online in a half an hour. If you're not following the Twitter, I have another channel linked down below where I do weekly videos. And if you have any ideas for future live stream content, plugins, questions, things that I could fiddle around with, you can also let me know about those as well. I think that's probably all I got for right now. So uh, until next stream, uh, please remember to have a sublime day. Or uh, for those of you living in the other part of the uh, world from me, a uh, sublime morning or afternoon. I think it's afternoon for some and mid-morning for others. Time zones are great, aren't they? <laughs> They're so cool. <laughs>